Hey, how's it going? Rusty Hazelden here, and welcome to The Art of V-Ray, Volume 1. In this video, we're going to harness the power of V-Ray to render an exciting television commercial featuring colorful splashes of paint. To get the most out of this video, make sure to download the project files linked in the description and give this tutorial a go. In this video, we're going to explore the more advanced features found in the VFB and demystify the V-Ray render settings. Start off by opening the scene file called Chapter 2. Let's start an interactive render by clicking the V-Ray icon in the upper left corner of the viewport. There are several hidden IPR modes that can be unlocked by right-clicking on the Debug Shading button. Right-click on the button and choose Isolate Selected. Then click the Select by Hierarchy button at the top of the screen to change the selection mode. This will allow us to easily select each paint can group. In Isolate Selected mode, only the actively selected objects in the viewport will be rendered. Hold down the Shift key and click in the viewport to select a few paint cans. Let's try the debug shading mode called Ambient Occlusion. This was a traditional lighting approach used to add shadow detail before the advent of true global illumination. We know that ambient occlusion is passe, so let's try the next lighting mode which is far more accurate. Select lighting to see the effect of global illumination lighting on the paint cans. This looks much more realistic. Now let's take a look at the V-Ray render settings. Click the Display Render Settings button. The Render Settings window is organized with tabs. Let's start on the Common tab. This tab is used to name the rendered images, set the frame range, and define the image resolution. I'm using a special value in the file name prefix field called a token. Right-click in the text field to display a list of available tokens. The scene token will name the images using the same name as the current Maya scene file. The image format is set to EXR Multi-Channel, which is a great format for rendering images as it supports high dynamic range data and EXRs can be easily used in many compositing packages. The animation section controls the frame range used when rendering animations. This shot begins on frame 0 and ends on frame 71. This will produce a 72-frame image sequence when batch rendered to disk. The renderable camera setting is used to select the camera view that will be used for batch rendering animations. The resolution section is used to define the image size. Rendering at 1920 by 800 will produce a beautiful animation, but if you're short on time, you can always scale this down to a smaller size and the render will take less time. Let's switch to the V-Ray tab. Here we can select the production renderer used to create our images. The production engine can be set to either CPU or CUDA. In CPU mode, the processor cores in your computer will be used for rendering. CPU mode has the advantage that it can utilize all of the RAM in your system and large scenes can be rendered easily. CUDA mode uses the GPU to render the scene. The entire scene has to fit into the available VRAM on board your GPU in order for this mode to work. In this tutorial, we're going to use the CPU rendering mode, so V-Ray artists on all platforms will get identical results. Each production engine has different image sampler settings. In CPU mode, you can choose between either the bucket or progressive sampler type. Let's turn off the viewport IPR mode by clicking on the icon. Now let's open up the VFB window by clicking the shelf icon. Select the progressive mode in the render settings window, and then click the Render button in the VFB. Progressive rendering is very similar to the IPR rendering mode. The whole frame is updated in passes until the final image is complete. Now let's compare progressive rendering to bucket rendering. Select Bucket Mode in the Render Settings and click Render. In Bucket Mode, the image is broken down into small tiles. Each bucket is rendered with a CPU core to full quality in a single pass. Having more CPU cores will give you faster renders. 
The rest of the image sampler settings are used to control the amount of noise in the rendered image. The V-Ray default settings provide a good starting point for most scenes. The threshold value acts as an overall quality knob, and it limits how many samples are calculated per pixel. Lowering the threshold will produce an image with less noise, but it will also take longer to render. 0.01 is the default value, and if you need a cleaner image, try lowering the threshold value to 0.005. Let's switch to the GI tab. GI stands for Global Illumination, and it refers to the way indirect light bounces around in a scene. GI helps to create more realistic lighting. In this tutorial, we're using a method of global illumination lighting called brute force with light cache. It's also known as the BFLC mode. There are many options in the GI tab, and the default settings work well for most scenes. The settings tab can be used to adjust advanced features like the dynamic memory limit. The overrides tab is used to fine tune settings related to cameras, lights, and materials. The IPR tab is used to adjust the quality of the interactive rendering in the VFB and the Maya viewport. Once again, the defaults work pretty well. The Render Elements tab is used to create extra render passes that can be used to isolate objects with mats, render individual lights, and denoise images. The left column lists all of the available render elements that can be added to your renders. The right column lists the active render elements in the scene. As you can see, I'm using two render elements in this scene, a denoiser and a sample rate. Render elements are also known as AOVs, which stand for Arbitrary Output Variables. You can easily view render elements in the VFB by selecting them from the pull-down menu. Select the Sample Rate Render Element. The Sample Rate is a diagnostic image that illustrates which areas took a really long time to render. Red areas required a high number of samples, and blue areas used fewer samples. This heat map can be used to identify objects that could be optimized to reduce render time. V-Ray's Denoiser does a great job at reducing the residual noise in rendered images. By using the Denoiser Render element, render times can be greatly reduced. The Denoiser runs automatically after the image is rendered in a post-process. The Denoiser will run on your GPU if you have one, otherwise it will run on your CPU. The denoiser render element actually consists of several render elements that are added automatically when it's active. In the VFB, select World Positions, then World Normals, and then Diffuse Filter. These are just a few of the extra images that are created by the denoiser render element. The original rendered image containing noise is called RGB color. Let's take a closer look at the noise in the teal paint. You can enlarge the image in the VFB with a scroll wheel on your mouse. Noise appears as speckles in the image. Now let's take a look at the result of the denoiser by switching to the denoiser render element in the VFB. The speckles have been removed and the teal paint is now smooth and noise free. To flip between the noisy and noise free image, simply click the tricolor button to the right of the render element menu. This toggles between the RGB color element and another render element called Effects Result, which is the final denoised image after all VFB effects have been applied. To quickly zoom out in the VFB, simply double click on the image. Let's take a break at this point, and in the next video, we're going to render paint splashes using Alembic caches. Well, let me know if you like this video and be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss the next tutorial. If you have any questions or suggestions, post them down below in the comments and I'll take a look. I'm Rusty Hazelden and thanks for watching.